and welcome to WEC Talk, the podcast series from the FIA World Endurance Championship. I'm Martin Haven, and in this episode, we'll catch up with Ben Keating to find out about life in Texas and learn a little more about his roots. In the Beckett briefing, Louise brings us up to speed with what our WEC teams and drivers have been getting up to. But first, we chat to a double World Endurance Champion. We head to the land of the long white cloud to catch up with the Kiwi star who started racing in New Zealand before moving to Europe. There he raced in the Formula Renault Euro Cup, in British F3, in A1 GP for Team New Zealand, in Formula Renault 3.5 and GP2, before finding himself without a full-time drive for 2012. And that's where he discovered sports cars, initially with Murphy prototypes in the European Le Mans series, and then with the 2012 LMP2 World Endurance Team Champions Starworks Motorsport in IMSA. When Porsche returned to top flight endurance racing, they came calling. And in four seasons, he took 12 race wins and the World Championship title in both 2015 and 2017. In 2017, he also won both Le Mans and Petit Le Mans and finally made his Formula One debut for Toro Rosso. Now he finds himself combining a Formula E campaign for Geox Dragon with the World Endurance Championship for Toyota Gazoo Racing. Welcome, Brendan Hartley. How are you doing? Very well. Well, how are you, more importantly? I'm uh, doing okay. It was quite a nice uh, little intro. I was guessing <laughs> you'll have a similar intro because I've seen you in most of the paddocks I've raced in. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm doing, uh, doing okay. I'm, I'm uh, on the other side of the world in New Zealand. Um, we, myself and Sarah, my wife, we, we made a decision about four weeks ago to hop on a plane and come home when it was very clear that everything was, was going to be cancelled. And I think so far that's proved to be a, um, a good decision because we, we, we just finished building a house here. So we, we've got space and we're not, you know, not living on top of each other like, like, like many of us do in Europe. So what's the situation then in New Zealand? How much lockdown and how much freedom of movement is there? Uh, so New Zealand went pretty aggressive in terms of lockdown rules. Um, so for the last two weeks, I think it's got maybe just slightly, slightly over two weeks, uh, the whole country has been locked down. All non-essential services and businesses have been closed. Um, we can leave our house to, to, to exercise, but, but all, all businesses are, are closed. Um, and, and I'd say, you know, New Zealand's done that um, I guess anticipating a bit more than other countries. I think our, our numbers are quite low in terms of infection rate and, and death rate, but we, we went quite hard and quite early for that. I know in the next week or so, I think it'll maybe some of the restrictions will start to start to open and, and business, you know, some of our businesses can, can go back to work. But yeah, since we've arrived, we've been here for four weeks. Um, part of the terms of arriving in New Zealand four weeks ago was to go into self isolation. So we've actually been in self isolation for four weeks, which basically just means that we you know, couldn't go to a cafe or a restaurant and, and uh, we needed to keep our distance from everyone. Um, but for the last two weeks, everyone's been in that same boat. And uh, yeah, quite proud of how New Zealand's been handling it and, and the whole country's got behind it and, and you know, there's, no, no one's really um, you know, flouting the rules and, and you know, everyone understands why, why we're doing it. And, and I think that the beauty of, of being in New Zealand is we have a lot of space and, and not so many people. So it is relatively easy to, to social distance. Now, normally, as a racing driver, you'd be out every day training. Are, are you a runner? Are you a cyclist? And are you doing that still? Definitely more of a cyclist than a runner. Um, so I'd say one of my, my biggest passions outside of driving race cars is, is riding my, my mountain bike and my road bike. Uh, so Sarah and I have mountain bikes here in New Zealand, and we've been getting out two, three days a week. Um, probably a little bit more on the cautious side since we've been in, in lockdown, you know, not, not, not going any crazy extreme trails and um, that kind of advice to, to take as little risk as possible. But I've also been doing a little bit of trail running. We're very lucky that where we live, we, we have some, some trails very close by that we can, we can access. So I've been keeping fit. We've been trying to make the most of it, like a lot of other people. And, um, you know, some yoga classes on, on streamed by the TV or, or YouTube or whatever, or Pilates. And, you know, we've, we've been just trying to keep fit and keep sane on the other side of it. I guess it's not just about, um, you know, strength and, and fitness it's also mental health just keeping active and and you know that, that's that's a form of keeping the same for me and what about keeping 
the brain sharp as well. Are you a gamer? Do you have anything there with you? Do you have a sim at home or? I used to be a gamer a long time ago, but never really racing games. So I was, <clears throat> I was uh, Counter Strike and Call of Duty and uh, first person shooters. I, I, I did used to enjoy that. that I'm talking 10, 12 years ago. I, I stopped, not because I didn't enjoy it, but because I felt much better when I wasn't cooped up inside looking at the computer screen. And uh, I guess I had a bit of a tendency to get a I get addicted, you know, probably the same reason I'm addicted to adrenaline and, and motorsport or riding my bike. It would be the same for me with, with gaming. So I, I haven't gamed in a, in a long, long time. Um, but what I did do is just before we went to into lockdown, I organized a simulator. The last two weeks, I have been dabbling with a little bit of online racing, which has been both fun and frustrating <laughs> because when you can when you can do something quite well in the real world, um, I drive a race car, and then in the the virtual world, you get your your butt absolutely kicked by the these gamers who you know, first of all I've never heard of, which isn't a problem, but you know they've spent a serious amount of hours on there, and it can be frustrating in the beginning, but it's also been really fun, you know, um, hooking up with with drivers all across the world and all different disciplines. I was actually I actually did a race last night. In a, in a speedway car, so dirt track ovals, with a whole lot of the New Zealand speedway guys, and it, I, what I found I've been enjoying more is actually um, racing in disciplines I wouldn't normally race in. So I've been doing a little bit of rallycross, a, yeah, a little bit of, of dirt track ovals, uh, but I'm not I'm not taking it too seriously. Um, it's it's been funny to um, to see all the drivers around the world scramble to get simulators and, and all go and racing online, and it's it, it's been quite fun. But the, the level is, is impressive. You know, not only do you have a lot of real world drivers that have been doing it for years, but also these gamers that, are, that have been doing it for years. And um, the racing's, it feels realistic. You know, there's been a couple of times lining up on the grid, lights are about to go out. You, you, feel, you feel your heart rate raise, you know, you feel like you're there. And it's, um, I, I see why people love it and, and, and are fully into it. I'm somewhat still sitting on the fence. I've, I've been enjoying it during this period. But I also find that I, I need some time to be outside during the day as well. And if I was to compete against some of these guys, like, for example, Max Verstappen or Lando Norris, I mean, they're huge gamers. And, I mean, I've been in a couple of little sessions with them and the level is, is incredibly high. To, to get to there or to some of these, these other guys that are good gamers, I don't think I see sunlight for the rest of the year. So <laughs> I'm kind of sitting on the fence if, if that's what I want to do or not. But in the, in the short term, it's been quite fun. And you know what? It, for the racecraft, and it, it, keep, it does keep you, does keep you pretty sharp in, in fairness, you know. Even, even if it's not exactly the same thing, that the the racecraft is, you know, the way you attack a driver and put him under pressure. I mean, it, it's the same, it's the same thing, you know. So it does, it does keep you sharp. Now with the world of of uh, sim racing and, and simulators, motorsports are in a new unique position that there's a transferable skill to to the virtual world that all of us can keep honing our skills and if you're if you're very good in a race car you're going to be okay i mean you're going to know how to drive a, a race simulator you know there's some correlation but if you're if you're a footballer and you're trying to play fifa on a playstation i, I don't think there's going to be a lot of correlation so we we, we are lucky that we, we have a, a tool in the virtual world that is pretty close to the real thing tell us about growing up in new zealand how did you end up being attracted to motorsport what was the link i mean my earliest memories were were watching my father at the racetrack so it's definitely in the family um i have an older brother that raced before me as well so yeah my, 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 my dad my dad raced pretty much anything on four wheels dirt track single seaters uh minis um i mean you name it he, he was doing it he, he gave up his racing when I was about five years old, uh, to put myself and my brother into go karts. My father had a family business that was building race engines, so it's it's, it's fair to say we always had a pretty handy engine. Dad was always down on the, the engine dyno until uh, all hours of the evening, getting those last percentage of horsepower out of you know out of the out of the engine. So we you know we were in a lucky position that we we grew up in a racing family. Um, so I, I did my first race in a go kart at six years old, and and I had the bug ever since. I was incredibly competitive in, in terms of wanting to win. And I think that that was one of the big draws to me, the competitive side of it, the 
the the unison between man and machine you know getting the most you know out of out of both those things um i started at a very young age and i followed my brother as well so i was very lucky to have a an older brother who was four years older so he he in a way paved the way for me um i'm not i'm not claiming i was any more talented than him but by the time i got and i made the next step in whatever it was if it was go-karts or single seaters um in some ways i had a four-year development head start you know my, my brother had been developing the formula forward for the last four years i'd hop straight in and, and had a finished product so i was quite lucky from that from that respect which is probably why he ended up being a an engineer and i ended up being a racing driver because you know he, he spent four years developing everything for me you could almost you can almost look at it like that so i had a you know i was very lucky um to have a, a family behind me and, and uh, had, had that family support from a very young age what do you remember about coming to europe and racing for the first time how old were you then i was 15 when I made my first trip to Europe. So I, I actually missed my end of year exams to partake in the Red Bull Young Driver Search, which I got selected. So it was a good decision missing those end of year exams. <laughs> and uh, the next the next year I, I traveled and traveled to Europe, left home, school, friends and family, and moved to a small town in Germany called Oschersleben. Looking back as a 16 year old, uh, it, it seems crazy that I left home out in the big world by myself, could barely locate Europe on a map, and, and here I was living there. Uh, but at the time, there was no question, even from my from my parents, you know, there was no no discussion. Actually, it was such a massive opportunity, and, and we, we didn't have family money and, and funding to do it. So it was it was an absolute dream opportunity that that, that wasn't going to come around again. Um, so yeah, we, we, I took it. I learned a lot in those first years. Uh, there was a few culture shocks, as you could imagine, and a bit of homesickness, particularly in the first year. And But I've now definitely made my life in, in Europe and, and majority of my friends are there. And, and uh, I've learned an incredible amount along my, you know, during my my career in Europe, you know, not only just about racing, but about different cultures and business. And, you know, it's, it's a pretty amazing sport to be in from that respect. You know, every year you're in a, in a different team from a different nationality and, and working with different people and, and team structures and hierarchies. And I think it, it's just as much a business as it, it is, as it is a sport. And um, yeah, I'm very lucky to have to been, to been uh, living it for the last however many years. Coming to the Toyota hybrid, from the beginning of the hybrid era, they came at all the problems from a slightly different direction. So how long has it taken to be intimate with your car because you have to know every single facet of every single adjustment on every page of the screen and and how every single it's no longer just enough to have good seat of the pants feel what the tires are telling you you've got to be juggling balls spinning plates patting your head rubbing your stomach i mean there's so much going on isn't there yeah and that that, that was interesting coming from the, the the Porsche and the P1 car to the Toyota uh, because, you know, we were, we were fierce competitors and we were, you know, trading pole positions and race wins. Um, so very clearly that the cars had a, a similar performance, uh, but the systems behind were completely different. Uh, again, equally as complex, but a different uh, 70 page driver manual to learn. Um, I guess because I've, I've been in so many different race cars in the last years, um, it, it it does become easier to, to learn a drive manual and, and understand um, the processes and, and systems in place. Um, but yeah, it was actually quite surprising how different the cars um, were to drive or are to drive. And um, it's been fun learning. Um, it, it wasn't straightforward. I didn't jump straight in the car in the Toyota and feel at home. And um, you know, all the other drivers in the team kind of let me know before that hey look this is this is going to take you if this is going to take you a little bit there's, there's there's not one single driver that's jumped straight in and been on the pace you know if it's fernando Alonso or whoever's jumped in the car no one has jumped in and, and feel right at home it's, it's quirky you know it's 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 a four-wheel drive monster um like the porsche was and with a lot of systems behind helping get the most out of it so it, it does take a while to learn all those diff- different systems you have to play with um, and, and all the, the little quirks of, 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 of the race car to get the most out of it. Um, so those, those first few tests were, were, were tricky, but again, having driven so many different cars and, and having that experience definitely helps. And by the time we got to, to Silverstone, I felt 
uh, pretty much on the pace and and uh, you know we, we finished behind our teammate by two seconds at the end of the race it was incredible it was an incredibly tight one um, so I, I, and now I feel you know that one with the car I, lo- I love it you know it's, it's it's a thrill to slice through the traffic or you know go through maggots back into Silverstone I mean that the car the car's awesome um, all albeit a little bit restricted with with the current um, WEC rules, you know, it's been strangled with fuel and, and weight, but it's still it's still a complete buzz to drive. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm definitely up to speed now. But it may look like the car's on rails and it's all very easy, but yeah, I can guarantee you there's, there's a bit to learn. It takes a bit to get the most out of these these complex cars. And that's the whole thing in motorsport, isn't it? You make it look easy, but you're on the knife edge the entire time. Otherwise, you're not racing; you're just driving around. Yes. <laughs> Whenever we next get a chance to drive around, uh, let's hope that sooner rather than later, uh, it'll be a pleasure to see you back in the paddock. Uh, meanwhile, keep healthy and uh, keep yourself sharp and uh, enjoy probably the longest time off you've ever had in your career. Time now for our weekly Beckett briefing. Louise Beckett, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you doing? Very good. Now, let's bring everybody up to speed. Last week, we talked to Sam Hignett at Jota Sport about what some of the teams are doing to try and help out the health professionals that are dealing with this COVID virus. And there's been a whole host of of other teams uh, and groups and manufacturers who are doing similar stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Well, really, Jota was just scratching the surface from the information that we've now got from all the teams. Aston Martin are working with Multimatic and they're producing a new respiratory protection device along with uh, personal protection equipment for all of the uh, national health frontline workers here in the UK. They're also running a scheme um, to offer emergency vehicle repairs to the NHS staff at their local hospital in Milton Keynes. So that's really good. Uh, Callum Boudra has said from uh, Rebellion that they are 100% focusing their resources on the pandemic and they're working with their sister company LMEO to uh, produce all the connectors and everything that go along with the ventilators. Um, Over in Italy we've got uh, Settilar Racing, they've been donating to the Italian healthcare um, with money saved since uh, Sebring actually and Roberto Lacorte's company Pharma Nutra have been donating medicines that are used in intensive care. So that's fantastic what they're doing there. And of course, we've got Ferrari, uh, the Agnetti family and their companies have been donating and assisting the Italian Civil Protection Department to a sum of 10 million euros. That's incredible, isn't it? And that's not that's not all. Ferrari have also been fundraising. They've got uh, they've reached the 1 million euro mark as well. And that's with equipment, uh, medical aids and helping people with the virus at the moment but they've also got this scheme in place uh, called back on track and that's looking ahead to when we are all out of this and when people are going back to work to ensure they've got a safe working environment they'll be uh, protecting their staff and have a screening for their staff and their families to make sure that everyone is healthy and safe and um, really assisting them with their, not only their health but psychologically as well and we know how bad it, Italy has been hit by this virus we've they were probably one of the first really that highlighted it to Europe yeah very much so so uh, our thoughts very much with the Italians and all those teams and a whole host more I mean we're really only scratching the surface here when yeah. we're talking about some of the teams we know about closer to my home in Leamington Spa Ricardo who are a huge design and engineering company they built the Audi gearboxes for their Le Mans prototypes, for instance, and a whole host of other things. They've also turned all their design and production over to producing protective equipment. Absolutely. In ProDrive as well, we should mention them because they also have been doing the same thing. So, yeah, it's, it's just it's fantastic to see how everybody's clubbed together. Now, on a slightly brighter note, lots of manufacturers, lots of racing championships are producing online content so lots of films are, that have been made are suddenly appearing online and free and being distributed by everybody i got to highlight Porsche at this stage they've just released a film called Endurance now it's yeah. from last year 
and it's the story of eight days in June where they took on the world's toughest endurance races, the 24 hours of Le Mans, and then the next week, the 24 hours of the Nürburgring. And world endurance fans will want to see the Le Mans stuff, but don't turn off then, because if you've never seen the Nürburgring 24 hours, <laughs> oh boy, buckle up. That's a, a great watch. That's on YouTube, it's called Endurance. And they've also, on Vimeo, the streaming service, if you search for Porsche AG, you'll find a whole bunch of videos they've released and they are releasing every few days their motorsport year. We're up to 2015 at the moment and that's basically everything. Porsche Super Cup, Carrera Cup, their GT racing, the prototypes of course in 2015. So uh, if you're a Porsche fan and there are a few around, there yeah. is plenty to see. There really is. And also, of course, the uh, Le Mans official film is also available on YouTube now. That has only been over the last week that they've launched that. So there's lots to watch. If you're missing your racing, you can look back at some incredible racing moments. And if you haven't got the Steve McQueen Le Mans movie on your shelf, really, what are you thinking of? Go <laughs> and find it somewhere and, and just treat yourself to 90 minutes of dialogue free opening scene before it all kicks off. Now, other good news, uh, Louise has been hunting around in her diary and we have a little song to sing, don't we, Louise? <laughs> well, you can sing it. I might mime it, which I normally do. <laughs> Not sure that works on radio. All right, so exactly. here we go then. Happy birthday to you. To you. Happy birthday <laughs> to you. Happy birthday, Darren Turner. Darren Turner. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> I'm not going to say how old he is. Um, we'll leave that number alone. But um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Darren a... had a lockdown birthday on Monday, so uh, yeah. I hope you enjoyed that. That singing, I mean. I hope you enjoyed that singing, Darren. <laughs> Probably not as much as he enjoyed his birthday. Now, <laughs> the final thing that we're going to talk about today, which is something that you picked up on, with it's Easter weekend, or it has just been Easter weekend, yeah. and in the UK, and I think in quite a lot of Europe, it has been warm and sunny for several weeks. Now, last time we raced at Easter time at Silverstone, Lou, that it wasn't the quite case, so warm, it? was it? No. Well, um, so I, I, this month I thought, okay, this is going to be maybe a bad April, but let's look back and think about all the amazing things, all the awesome Aprils that we've had and what we've done in years gone by. And um, of course, in 2016 is when we were at Silverstone and it was snowing during free practice. I mean, that, and that was the first time. Obviously, we've had it since now with Spa as well. But um, that was just amazing to see I, I still remember how cold my hands were in the pit lane <laughs> yeah we all still remember how cold your hands were <laughs> and it, like it, just those sights of all the cars and the drivers you know like see I mean, I'm, I'm surprised people haven't used that as their christmas cards actually since yeah. then yeah, I remember um, hearing, I'm sure it was Loic Deval um, on the radio saying, get my camera, get my camera. I need a picture of me in the car in the snow. <laughs> well, listen, Lou, hopefully we'll be able to catch up with you again next week for more from the Beckett Briefing. Next, we return to the Lone Star State, the venue for the most recent World Endurance Race back in February, when the world was a very different place. Our guest today graduated with an honours degree in engineering from Texas A&M and started selling cars before buying into his father's dealership at the age of just 25. He bought his first dealership in 2002 and has purchased one every year since. His Viper Exchange is the world's biggest volume seller of Vipers, and he began racing in Viper Championships, graduating to GT Porsches, before making his Le Mans debut in 2015 in a Viper. What else? Since then, he's returned to Le Mans every year, in an Orica Nissan, a Riley Gibson, a Ferrari 488, and most notably last year, in the first privateer Ford GT to start the race. Unfortunately, the team's win at the chequered flag was later overturned, but that does nothing to diminish the magnitude of the effort. This season, he's raced the number 57 Team Project One Porsche in the GTE AM class of the World Endurance Championship, finishing third in Shanghai, second in Fuji, and then winning in Bahrain. Welcome, Ben Keating. 
Well, thank you, Martin. I'm excited to uh, excited to be on the show. Ben, where do we find you today? Today, I am in my office. I am grateful to, that the car business is considered to be an essential business, even though we're all on lockdown and the rules of business are very, very different than they were. I'm grateful to still be coming to the office, if for nothing else, just to be able to get out of the house uh, for a little bit. But our business is, is down uh, a lot, as you would expect with everyone on lockdown. But uh, even if it's off by 50%, uh, 50% is a much better than 0%. So uh, I'm in the office today and, and glad to be here. Are you able to get out and about to keep fit? I mean, obviously, that's a big part of most racing drivers' lives. I would say more than ever before. Usually, for me, it's a matter of having the time. I was expecting to be uh, at, the, at a racetrack for most of the past month, and obviously that hasn't happened. So my schedule has opened up a bunch, and you know, my, my chosen form of exercise or or uh, staying fit is by riding a bicycle. I have done more miles on a bicycle in this last four weeks than I ever have in any four week period. And I am in the best fitness, uh, cycling fitness that I've ever been in, uh, which is exciting. Uh, so uh, uh, I've been doing that. And then uh, when I'm at home, looking for something to fill the time. I've spent a lot of time on the simulator, uh, which is not the same level of fitness, but uh, you, your heart rate still gets up. I still end up sweating a ton when I'm behind the wheel of the simulator, uh, but it does a lot for working on, you know, maintaining focus and, and hitting your marks and doing those types of things that the same way it would be behind the wheel of a race car. I, I, I greatly miss uh, racing. Uh, you know, for, for me, uh, it ends up being one of the most relaxing things uh, in my life. Uh, and I enjoy being able to walk away from everything else I have going on and, uh, you know, show up at the racetrack and just focus on the one thing. Uh, but uh, I am, I'm a very competitive uh, minded individual. Uh, and uh, even though we're not competing uh, at the racetrack, uh, I still keep in mind that uh, one day very soon we will be racing. Uh, and I want to make sure I do whatever I can today to put me in a better position uh, to perform uh, in the race car when we are back uh, at the track. Now, a lot of the young pro drivers and the not so young pro drivers all started very young, karting, junior single seaters and so on. Your introduction to motorsport was a little different, wasn't it? It was a gift. Uh, that's right. A, birth, a, a Christmas present from my wife uh, back in 2005. Uh, and then, you know, uh, that eventually turned up into me uh, uh, racing for the first time ever in 2007. And it's gone from there. One thing that many people don't know about me is that uh, I went through uh, drug uh, rehab uh, twice in high school. I like to joke about the fact that uh, my personality hasn't changed at all. My drug of choice is just different now. Uh, now uh, I choose to drive a race car to get my fix. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm grateful that I'm in a position now that, that I can afford to go out and play with those toys. That was definitely the Christmas gift that kept on giving, wasn't it? Hey, absolutely. The most expensive Christmas present ever. <laughs> yeah, it cost you. No, I, you know, hers was the initial expenditure. After that, she went, okay, you're on your own with this big boy. That's right. But I mean, I, you know, she is so awesome. I, I'm, I, I'm also very grateful, you know, that, you know, she enjoys the fact that I enjoy uh, racing. You know, she actually said yesterday, 
she said, you're going to think I'm crazy to say this, but I miss going to the track. I miss racing. Uh, you know, I miss seeing those people uh, in those relationships. And uh, uh, it, that's when you really know that cabin fever is setting in. You know, uh, when your wife says she misses going to the track, then, uh, then, we, then it's a really serious problem. Well, let's talk about those relationships because <laughs> this year is your first in the World Endurance Championship, all right? You spend a lot of time racing in uh, American Le Mans series and in IMSA in the States. So you knew the tracks, you knew the personalities. This is kind of venturing out into the unknown. So how has that been? It's been incredible. One of the things I always say is that, you know, everyone's opinion about something is based on a comparison. Uh, you don't know whether or, li whether or not you like or dislike something unless you have something to compare it to. I have been in a lot of series, uh, and they all have their built-in pros and cons, uh, but I, I have really seriously enjoyed the World Endurance Championship this year. One of the biggest issues or challenges uh, that many series deal with is the, the whole question of balance of performance. I really love the way the World Endurance Championship is structured for GTM specifically uh, because, you know, we are all racing the pro cars of prior years. And because of that, all these pro drivers and pro teams have run these cars for a full year the series has a full year of data to look at so they can get it right for us to go out and race. Uh, uh, and then in order to, to, to level the playing field a little bit, you know, this year they've added uh, the success ballast or rewards weight, whatever you want to call it for GTM. Uh, and, you know, uh, different people have different opinions of it, but I personally love it. I, I think it's a it's an incredible system. Uh, I love uh, the GTM structure of three drivers with a bronze and a silver and uh, and a pro. Uh, and uh, so, you know, so far, uh, so good. I, I, I really am enjoying the structure of the series. I, I'm loving it. Finally, the news broke on Easter Sunday that Sir Sterling Moss had died at his home in London, aged 90, after a long illness. As a racing driver, Moss had few peers, and he became as synonymous with the sport he loved as Pele and Muhammad Ali. Sterling's father, Alfred, was a keen amateur racer who'd even competed in the 1924 Indy 500. Sterling and younger sister Pat were gifted horse riders, but Sterling's father gave him his first car at the age of nine and he was bitten by a new bug. He started racing in 1948, first leaping to international attention by winning the RAC Tourist Trophy at Dundrod in Northern Ireland on the eve of his 21st birthday, the first of his seven TT wins. His victory in the British Grand Prix at Aintree in 1955, beating Mercedes teammate the great Juan Manuel Fangio, saw him become the first Englishman ever to win his home Grand Prix, and he was also the first Englishman to win a Grand Prix in a British car. Moss always considered Fangio the greatest racing driver that had ever lived, but in sports cars especially, Moss simply had no peer. Chief among his many legendary drives, was his still barely credible triumph in perhaps the most dangerous road race of them all, the Mille Miglia. With journalist Dennis Jenkinson reading pace notes from a homemade system, the duo covered the thousand mile distance in 10 hours and seven minutes, averaging more than 157 kilometers an hour, almost 98 miles an hour over the rough, bumpy, dusty Italian roads. Between 1948 and 1962, Sterling started 529 races, winning 212 of them, often taking great delight in his role as underdog against the might of the continental opposition. But on Easter Monday 1962, his top flight racing career came to an abrupt end 
in an accident at Goodwood, which nearly cost the boy Wander his life. Moss recovered from a coma and returned to test a lotus the following year, but felt that his innate abilities had been blunted and hung up his helmet as a full-time racer. Later in life, he did return to the track, first in touring cars, then racing into his 80s in a wide variety of historic machinery, winning generations of new fans, the living exemplar of the dashing, gentleman racing driver. We will not see his like again. The FIA World Endurance Championship extends its sincerest sympathies to his widow, Lady Susie.